Chapter 4 The Aleuts left on a sunless day. Out of the north, deep waves rolled down upon the island. They broke against the rocks and roared into the caves, sending up white sprays of water. Before night, a storm would certainly strike. Not long after dawn, the Aleuts took down their skin tents and carried them to the beach. Captain Orlov had not paid any, my father for the otter he had killed. So when the news came that the hunters had packed their tents, all of our tribe left the village and hurried toward the coral cave. The men with their weapons went first and the women followed. The men took the trail that led to the beach, but the women hid themselves among the brush on the cliff. Ulop and I went together far out on the ledge where I had hid before when the hunters first came. <coughs> Page 20. The tide was low, and the rocks and the narrow beach were scattered with bundles of otter pelts. Half of the hunters were on the ship. The rest were wading into the water, tossing the pelts into a boat. The Aleuts laughed while they worked, as if they were happy to leave the island. My father was talking to Captain Orlov. I could not hear their words because of the noise the hunters made, but from the way my father shook his head, I knew that he was not pleased. He is angry, Yulape whispered. Not yet, I said. When he's really angry, he pulls his ear. The men who were working on the canoe had stopped and were watching my father and Captain Orlov. The other men of, their, of our tribe stood at the foot of the trail. The boat went off to the ship filled with otter. As it reached the ship, Captain Orlov raised his hand and gave a signal. When the boat came back, it held a black chest, which two of the hunters carried to the beach. Captain Orlov raised the lid and pulled out several necklaces. There was little light in the sky, yet the beads sparkled as he turned them this way and that. Beside me, Lape drew in her breath in excitement, and I could hear her cries of delight from the women hidden in the brush. But the cries suddenly ceased as my father shook his head and turned his back on the chest. The Aleut stood silent. Our men left their places at the foot of the trail and moved forward a few steps and watched, watching my father. One string of beads for one otter pelt is not our bargain, my father said. One string and one iron spearhead, said Captain Orlov, lifting two fingers. The chest does not hold that much, my father answered. There are more chests on the ship, said the Russian. Then bring them to shore, my father said. You have 105 bales of otter on the ship. There were 15 here in the cove. You will need three more chests of this size. Captain Orlov said something to his Aleuts that I could not understand, but its meaning was soon clear. There were many hunters in the cove, and as soon as he spoke, they began to carry the otter pelts to the boat. Beside me, Yalape was scarcely breathing. Do you think that he will give us the other chests? She whispered. I do not trust him. When he gets the pelts to the ship, he may leave. <clears throat> it is possible. Page 22. The hunters had to pass my father to reach the boat, and when the first one approached him, he stepped in his path. The rest of the pelts must stay here, he said, facing Captain Orlov, until the chests are brought. The Russian drew himself up stiffly and pointed to the clouds that were blowing in the, toward the island. I load the ship before the storm arrives, he said. Give us the other chest, then I will help you with our canoes, my father replied. Captain Orlov was silent. His gaze moved slowly around the cove. He looked at our men standing on the ledge of the rock a dozen paces away. He looked upward toward the cliff and back at my father, then spoke to his alutes. I do not know what happened first, whether it was my father who raised his hand against the hunter whose path he bared, whether it was this man who stepped forward with a bale of pelts on his back and shoved my father aside. It all happened so quickly that I could not tell one act from the other. But as I jumped to my feet and Yulape screamed and the other cries sounded along the cliff, I saw a figure lying on the rocks. It was my father, and blood was on his face. Slowly he got to his feet. <clears throat> with their spears raised, our men rushed down across the ledge. A puff of white smoke came from the deck of the ship. A loud noise echoed against the cliff. Our <clears throat> five of our warriors fell and lay quiet. Yulape screamed again and flung a rock into the cove. It fell harmlessly beside Captain Orlov. 
Rock showered into the cove from many places along the cliff, striking several of the hunters. Then our warriors rushed in upon them, and it was hard to tell one from the other. Yulape and I stood on the cliff and watched helplessly, afraid to use the rocks we held least, lest we injure our own men. The Aleuts had dropped the other bales of otter. They drew knives from their belts, and as our warriors rushed upon them, the two lines surged back and forth along the beach. Men fell to the sand and rose to fight again. Others fell, and they did not get up. My father was one of these. For a long time, it seemed that we would win the battle. Captain Orlov, who had rowed off to the ship when the battle started, he returned with more of the Hizalutes. Our warriors were forced backward to the cliffs. There were a few of them left, yet they fought at the foot of the trail and would not retreat. The wind began to slow, and suddenly Captain Orlov and his Aleuts turned and ran to the boat. Our men did not pursue them. The hunters reached the ship, the red sails went up, and the ship moved slowly between the two rocks that guard the cove. Once more before it disappeared, a white puff of smoke rose from the deck. As Yulape and I ran along the cliff, a whirring sound like a great bird in flight passed above our heads. The storm, storm struck us as we ran, driving rain into our faces. Then other women were running beside us, and their cries were louder than the wind. At the bottom of the trail, we came upon our warriors. Many had fought on the beach. Few had left it, and of these, they were all wounded. My father lay on the beach, and the waves were already washing over him. Looking at his body, I knew that he should not have told Captain Orlov his secret name. And back in our village, all the weeping women and the sad men agreed that this had, been, had so weakened him that he had not lived through the fight with the Aleuts and the dishonest Russian. <clears throat> so, that's the end of chapter 4. Here's chapter 5 now. That night was the most terrible time in all the memory of Galust. When the fateful day had dawned, the tribe numbered 42 men, counting those who were too old to fight. When night came and the women had carried back to the village those who had died on the beach of Coral Cove, there remained only 15. Of course, of these, seven were old men. There was no woman who had not lost her father, or a husband, or a brother, or a son. The storm lasted two days. And the third day, we buried our head, our dead, on the south headland. The Aleuts, had, who had fallen on the beach, we burned. For many days after that, the village was quiet. People, they went out only to gather food and came back to eat in silence. Some wished to leave and go in their canoes to the island called Santa Catalina, which lies far off to the east. But others said that there was little water on that island. In the end, a council was held and it was decided to stay at Galath. The council also chose a new chief to take my father's place. His name was Kimki. He was very old, but he had been a good man in his youth and a good hunter. The night he was chosen to be chief, he called everyone together, saying, Most of those who snared fowl and found fish in the deep water and built canoes are gone. The women, who were never asked to do more than stay at home, cook food, and make clothing, now must take the place of the men and face the dangers which abound beyond the village. There will be grumbling in Galilast because of this. There will be shirkers. These will be punished. For without the help of all, all must perish. Kimki portioned work for each one of the tribes, giving Yulape and me the task of gathering abalones. This shellfish grew on the rocks along the shore and was plentiful. We gathered them at low tide in baskets and carried them to the mesa where we cut the dark red flesh from the shell and placed it on the flat rocks to dry in the sun. Ramo had the task of keeping the abalone safe from the seagulls, especially the wild dogs. Dozens of our animals, which had left the village when uh, their owners had died, joined the wild pack that roamed the island. They soon grew as fierce as the wild ones and only came back to the village to steal food. Each day toward evening, Yulape and I helped Ramo put the abalones in baskets and carry them to the village for safekeeping. 
And during this time, other women were gathering the scarlet apples that grow on the cactus bushes, and they're called tunas. Fish were caught, and many birds were netted. So hard did the women work that we really fared better than before when the hunting was done by the men. Life in the village should have been peaceful, but it was not. The men said that the women had taken the task that right, rightfully were theirs, and now that they had become hunters and the men looked down upon them. There was much trouble over this until Kimki decreed that the work would again be divided. Henceforth, the men would hunt and the women harvest. Since there was already ample food to last through the winter, it was no longer mattered who hunted. But this was not the real reason why autumn and winter were unpeaceful in Galisat. Those who had died in Coral Cove were still with us. Everywhere we went on the island or on the sea, whether we were fishing or eating or sitting by the fires at night, they were with us. We all remembered someone. Or, and I remember my father, so tall and strong and kind. A few years ago, my mother had died, and since then, Ulape and I had tried to do the task she had done. Ulape, even more than I, being older, <clears throat> now that my father was gone, it was not easy to look after Ramo, who was always into some mischief. It was the same in the other houses of Kalisat, but more than the burdens which had fallen upon us all, it was the memory of those who had gone that burdened our hearts. After food had been stored in the autumn and the baskets were full in every house, there was more time to think about them, so that a sort of sickness came over the village and people sat and did not speak, nor even laughed. In the spring, Kimki called the tribe together. He had been thinking, he said, during the winter, and he decided that he would take a canoe and go to the east to the country which was there and which he had once been to when he was a boy. It lay many days across the sea. But he would go there and make a place for us. He would go alone, because he could not spare more of our men for the voyage, and he would return. The day that Kimki left was fair. We all went to the cove and watched him launch the big canoe. It held two baskets of water and enough tunas and dried abalone to last many days. <clears throat> we watched while Kimki paddled through the narrow opening in the rocks, Slowly he went through the kelp beds and into the sea. There he waved to us and we waved back. The rising sun made a silver trail across the water. Along this trail he disappeared into the east. The rest of the day we talked about the journey. Would Kimki ever reach this far country about which nothing was known? Would he come back before winter was over or, or never? That night we sat around the fire and talked while the wind blew and the waves crashed against the shore. <clears throat> Chapter 6, page 30. After Kimki had gone one moon, we began to watch for his return. Every day someone went to the cliff to scan the sea, even on stormy days we went, and on days when fog shrouded the island, during the day there was always a watcher on the cliff, and each night, as we sat around our fires, we wondered if the next sun would bring him home. But the spring came and left, and the sea was empty. Kimki did not return. There were few storms that winter, and rain was light and ended early. This meant that we would need to be careful with water. You see, in the old days, the springs sometimes ran low, and no one worried, but now everything seemed to cause alarm. Many were afraid that we would die of thirst. There are other things more important to ponder, said Matasip, who had taken Kimki's place. Matasip meant the Aleuts, for it was now the time of the year when they had come before. Watchers on the cliff began to look for the red cells, and a meeting was held to plan what to do if the Aleuts came. We lacked the men to keep them from landing or to save our lives if they attacked us which we were certain that they would. Plans were therefore made to flee as soon as their ship was sighted. <laughs> Food and water were stored in canoes, and these were hidden on the rocks at the south end of the island. The cliffs were steep here and very high, but 
we wove a stout rope of bull kelp and fastened it to the rocks at the top of the cliff so that it hung to the water. As soon as the Aleut ship was sighted, we would all go to the cliff and let ourselves down, one at a time. We would then leave in our canoes for the island of Santa Catalina. Although the entrance to Coral Cove was too narrow for a ship to pass through safely at night, men were sent there to watch the cove from dusk to dawn. And besides, those who watched during the day, shortly afterwards, one on a night of a fine moon, one of the men came running back to the village. Everyone was asleep, but his cries quickly wakened us. The Aleuts! he shouted. The Aleuts! It was news we expected. We were pre prepared for it, yet there was much fear in the village of Galisat. Matasape stro strode from hut to hut, telling everyone to be calm and not to lose time packing things that would not be needed. I took my skirt of yucca fiber, for however, for I had spent many days making it, and it was very pretty, and also my otter cape. Quietly, we filed out of the village along the trail that led toward the place where our canoes were hidden. The moon was growing pale, and there was faint light in the east, but a strong wind began to blow. We had gone no further than a half a league when we were overtaken by the man who had given the warning. He spoke to Madison, but we all gathered around to listen to him. I went back to the cove after I gave the alarm, he said. And when I got there, I could see the ship clearly. It is beyond the rocks that guard the harbor. It is a smaller ship than the one which belonged to the Aleuts. The sails are white instead of red. Well, could you see anyone? Matasup asked. No. It's not the same ship which was here last spring. No. Matasup was silent, pondering the news. Then he told us to go on to where the canoes were and wait for him, for he was going back. It was light now and we went quickly over the dunes to the edge of the cliff and stood there while the sun rose. The wind grew cold, but fearing that those on the ship would see the smoke, we did not start a fire, though we had meal to cook for breakfast. Instead of we ate a small quantity of dried abalone, and afterwards my brother Ramo climbed over the cliff. No one had been down to the rocks since the canoes were hidden, so we did not know whether they were still safe or not. And while we, he was gone, we saw a man running across the dunes. It was Nanko, carrying a message from Matasip. He was sweating in spite of the cold, and he stood trying to catch his breath. We all waited, urging him to talk. But his face was happy, and we knew that he brought good news. Speak, everyone said in chorus. I have been running for more than a league, he said. I cannot talk. You are talking, someone said. Speak, Nanko, speak, cried many voices. Nanko was having fun with us. He threw out his chest and took a deep breath. He looked around at the circle of faces as if he did not understand why everyone was staring at him. The ship, he said at last. Saying the words slowly, does not belong to our enemies, the Aleuts. There are white men on this ship, and they have come from that place where Kimki went when he was left our island. Has Kimki returned? An old man broke in. No, but it is he who saw the white men and told them to come here. What do they look like? Yulapi asked. Are there boys on the ship? Asked Ramo, who had come back with a mouthful of something. Everyone seemed to be talking all at once. Nanko made his face stern, which was hard for him to do because his mouth had been cut in the battle with the Aleuts, and ever since it had always seemed like he was smiling. He held up his hand for silence. The ship has come for one reason, he said, to take us away from Galaset. Well, to what place? I asked. It was good news that the ship did not belong to the Aleuts. But where would the white men take us? I do not know to what place, he said. Kimki knows, and he has asked the white men to take us there. Saying no more, Nanko turned back, and we followed him. We were fe fearful of where we were going, yet we were happy too. So think about that. You really have to think about the trust. You know, are these men on the ship, are they who they say they are? Did Kimki really send them? And would you, would you get on this ship and go with these strange people? You know, maybe, maybe they are not who they say they are. 
Maybe Kim, they don't even know who Kim Ki are. Maybe they just came and, and, and they're part of like you know what we talked about in U.S. history about uh, slavery. Maybe they were going to take them into slavery. Uh, so again, you know, you you have to wonder: Would you trust these the white men who came on this ship? I know the flag is a different color; it's not red. This time it's white. And a lot of times countries flew a different flag. But would you trust these people? You know, they saw what happened last time. They trusted these people. So that's a good question to end that on. Um, so make sure you guys answer your Google Form questions. All right. Chapter seven, page thirty-five. We took nothing with us when we thought we would have to flee, so there was much excitement as we packed our baskets. Nanko, Nanko strode up and down the outside of the houses, urging us to hurry. The wind grows strong, he shouted. The ship will leave you. I filled two baskets with things I wished to take. Three fine needles of whalebone and all for making holes. A good stone knife for scraping hides. Two cooking pots and a small box made from a shell with many earrings in it. Ulape had two boxes of earrings, for she was vainier than I, and when she put them in her basket, she drew a thin mark with blue clay across her nose and cheekbones. The mark meant that she was unmarried. The ship leaves, shouted Nanko. If it goes, Ulape shouted back, it will come again after the storm. My sister was in love with Nanko, but she laughed at him. Other men will come to the island, she said. They will be far more handsome and brave than those who leave. You are all women of such ugliness that they will be afraid and soon go away. The wind blew in fierce gust as we left the village. Stinging our faces with sand, Ramo hopped along far in the front of the, one of the baskets. But before long, he ran back to say that he had forgotten his fishing spear. Nanko was standing on the cliff, motioning us to hurry. So I refused to let him go back for it. The ship was anchored outside the cove, and Nanko said that it would not come closer to the shore because of the high waves. Thus, we're beating against the rocks with the sound of thunder. The shore, as far as I could see, was rimmed with foam. Two boats were pulled up on the beach. Beside them stood four white men, and as we came down the trail, one of the men beckoned us to walk faster. He spoke to us in a language which we could not understand. The men of our tribe, except Nanko and Chief Matasep, we're already on the ship. My brother Ramo was there too, Nanko said. He had run ahead after I had told him that he could not go back to the village for his spear. Nanko said that he had jumped into the first boat that left the cove. Matasep divided the women into two groups. Then the boats were pushed into the water, and while they bobbed about, we scrambled into them as best as we could. The cove was partly sheltered from the wind, but as soon as we went through the passage between the rocks and into the sea, great waves struck us. There was much confusion. Spray flew, the white men shouted at each other, the boat pitched so wildly that in one breath you could see the ship, and in the next breath it had gone. Yet we came back to it at last and somehow were able to climb onto the deck. The ship was large, many times the size of our biggest canoes. It had two small masts, and between them stood a young man with blue eyes and a black beard. He was the chieftain of the white men, for he began to shout orders which they quickly obeyed. Sails rose on the tall mast, and the two of them of the men began to pull on the rope that held the anchor. I called to my brother knowing that he was very curious and therefore would be in the way of the men who were working. The wind drowned my voice, and he did not answer. The deck was so crowded that it was hard to move but when I went from one end to the other calling his name still there was no answer no one had seen him at last I found Nanko I was overcome with fear where is my brother I cried he repeated what he had told me back on the beach but he spoke Ulape as he spoke Ulape who stood beside him pointed toward the island I looked out across the deck in the sea there running along the cliff the fishing spear held over his head was Rama. The sails had filled, and the ship was now moving slowly away. Everyone was looking toward the cliff, even the white men. I ran to one of them and pointed, but he shook his head and turned from me. The ship began to move faster. Against my will, I screamed. Chief Matasip grasped my arm. We cannot wait for Ramo, he said. If we do, the ship will be driven on the rocks. We, we must, I shouted. We must. The ship will come back for him on another day, Matasip said. He will be safe. <clears throat> there is food for him, for him to eat and water to drink and places to sleep. No, I cried. Madison's face was like stone. He was not listening. 
I cried out once more, but my voice was lost in the howling wind. People gathered around me, saying again what Matasep had said, yet I was not comforted by their words. Ramo had disappeared from the cliff, and I knew that he was now running along the trail that led to the beach. The ship began to circle the kelp bed, and I thought surely that it was going to return to the shore. I held my breath, waiting. Then slowly its direction changed. It pointed toward the east. At that moment I walked across the deck, and though many hands tried to hold me back, flung myself into the sea. A wave passed over my head, and I went down and down until I thought I would never behold the day again. The ship was far away when I rose. Only the sails showed through the spray, and I was still clutching the basket that held all of my things, but it was very heavy, and I realized that I could not swim with it in my arms, letting it sink. I started off toward the shore. I could barely see the two rocks that guarded the entrance to Coral Cove, but I was not fearful. Many times I had swum farther than this, although not in a storm. I kept thinking over and over as I swam how I would punish Ramo when I reached the shore, yet when I felt the sand underneath under my feet and saw him standing at the edge of the waves holding his fishing spear and looking so forlorn, I forgot all those things I planned to do. Instead, I fell to my knees and put my arms around him. The ship had disappeared. When will it come back? Ramo asked. There were more tears in his eyes. Soon, I said. The only thing that made me angry was that my beautiful skirt of yucca fibers, which I had worked on so long and carefully, was ruined. <laughs>